medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram update. Today we're going to talk about bird flu, H5N1. We're also going to talk about the measles outbreak in West Texas and what's going on there in Africa with that mysterious outbreak. We talk a lot on this channel about some of the natural things that you can do to help enhance your immune system. And recently, I had the privilege of sitting down with Dr. Andrew Huberman from the Huberman Lab. And for three and a half hours, we discussed things like sunlight, hydrotherapy, the innate immune system, and even the issue of trust. It's on his podcast. We'll put a link in the description below. If you are a healthcare provider or even a patient, we have wonderful medical courses at medcram.com. They are CME certified. Everything from EKG to understanding what a complete blood count laboratory test is to interpreting pulmonary function tests. Join us at medcram.com. So let's talk about H5N1. And there are new reports today, this is on March 4th, that there is yet again confirmed H5N1 avian flu detection in Idaho dairy cattle. This is actually the first since October. So now we're up to about 977 detections in dairy cattle from at least 17 states. We're also seeing this in domestic cats as well. This is the same H5N1 in domestic cats. And we're also seeing it in some of the actual pet food as well. It says here that a Washington-based pet food maker, Wild Coast Raw, recently recalled some of its raw food after an investigation into deaths found a link to the food, which is only sold in those two states, specifically Washington and Oregon. There's been a couple of other detections involving cats in Colorado and New Jersey, and also some H5N1 detections in chickens from two states, specifically in New York and Wyoming. Which brings us to the bigger picture right now, which is a looming global threat. And if we're talking about birds or mammals, it looks as though of all of the birds that are infected, about 16% of those are either threatened, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And 27% of the mammals that have been infected with H5N1 are near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. Also concerning is the fact that whereas only 46 species were infected from 2017 to 2020, since then, that number has jumped to 457, showing us that this virus is becoming well adapted at surviving and adapting itself to be able to infect more species. The article goes on to talk about the amount of endangered species that are being affected by H5N1, especially in birds, and then goes on to talk about this effect in mammals. They say massive mortalities have been reported in some species. For instance, more than 24,000 sea lions died in coastal areas of South America in less than one year. The 27% of the mammalian species affected by H5N1 are also of conservation concern. I think the bottom line that we've talked about with H5N1 is to be prepared. Number one, be very careful, especially if your occupation means that you're going to be either around birds or cattle. Make sure you have a healthy immune system and you're doing everything that you can to improve your immune system. Understand some of the hacks that we've talked about in terms of improving your immune system through sunlight, through raising body temperature, some of those things that we talked about in the Huberman podcast, and realize that while they are developing vaccines for H5N1, they're still quite a ways out, and there's no guarantee that they're going to have enough at the time to vaccinate everyone. They're planning on having about 10 million in the earlier part of this year. Those are going to be targeted for those people who are working in industries who are at high risk. Let's move on to the measles situation that we have right now in West Texas. It appears that instead of just West Texas, the Montgomery County Department of Health, which includes the Philadelphia area, reported a measles case in an unvaccinated resident, a child who rode the shuttle bus from John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York City. And you can bet that county health officials are trying to track down all of those that had close contacts. Measles is extremely contagious. It is airborne and has a very high R naught. I want to make sure that everyone understands, and we'll put a link in the description below, that this is where you can go on a weekly basis from the CDC to get updates on measles cases and outbreaks. 
And this was updated on February 28th, that was last Friday, about exactly what it is that's going on in terms of measles cases in 2025. A total of 164 measles cases were reported by nine jurisdictions, that is in Alaska, California, Georgia, Kentucky, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York City, Rhode Island, and Texas. And they provide links here where you can actually go to those departments in the states and you can figure out exactly what it is that's going on in your area. Total cases right now in the United States, 164, and you can see the age breakdown of those cases and also know what the vaccination status is. Currently, 95% of the patients that have the measles is either unvaccinated or unknown, and we have one MMR dose, about 3%, two MMR doses, about 2%. In terms of hospitalizations, about 20% of these cases are hospitalized, and you can see here by age group how many of them are in what particular age. And as we know, there's been one death confirmed from measles at this point. If you want to compare that to last year in 2024 for all 12 months, there's only a total of 285 total cases. You can see what the vaccination status was in that situation and hospitalizations and, of course, the percent of age group hospitalized. Pretty good resource, and I will put a link in the description below. So the question is, is what is the response at the federal level? And I'll call your attention here to our new HHS director, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who titles this opinion piece, Measles Outbreak is a Call to Action for All of Us. The MMR vaccine is crucial to avoiding potential deadly disease. And he says here, vaccines not only protect individual children from measles, but also contribute to community immunity, protecting those who are unable to be vaccinated due to medical reasons. And he goes on to say here, I have directed the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response to work closely with the Texas Health Authorities to provide comprehensive support. HHS's effort include offering technical assistance, laboratory support, vaccines, and therapeutic medications as needed. The CDC is in continuous communication with Texas health officials, ensuring a coordinated and effective response to contain the outbreak. I have spoken with Governor Greg Abbott and Texas health officials, committing to providing them any additional support they need to bring this outbreak to an end. I've also spoken with the bereaved parents of the deceased child to offer consolation. He also goes on to say, as healthcare providers, community leaders, and policymakers, we have a shared responsibility to protect public health. This includes ensuring that accurate information about vaccine safety and efficacy is disseminated. We must engage with communities to understand their concerns, provide culturally competent education, and make vaccines readily accessible for all those who want them. I think this is going to be interesting. We're only two months into the year, and we're almost at half the cases that we had last year. What's interesting to me is that nearly half of the cases are between the ages of 5 and 19, but a third of the cases that are hospitalized are under the age of 5 years. We're going to want to make sure that our most vulnerable and youngest population doesn't get hit. And we'll be keeping an eye on this regularly and posting. Finally, what is it that's going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo? It's a very significant, severe, unexplained illness cluster. And the question is, is it a virus? Is it meningitis? Or is it something else? And this is an unexplained illness cluster that actually began earlier this year. And they're actually happening in two different areas in the DR Congo. There's been two unexplained illness clusters in Ecuador province, a smaller one in Bolumba Health Zone that began in January, and a larger one in Basan Kasu Health Zone that began early in February with a report of 24 unexplained deaths from a single village. The WHO said that the epidemiological investigation does not show a link between outbreaks at the two locations, which are about 100 miles apart and separated by dense forests and poor infrastructure. So it seems as though these two outbreaks may be coincidental. Fever was one of the symptoms in a broad case definition, and initial fears of Marburg, which we've covered here, and Ebola virus were ruled out in earlier testing. 53 deaths. Most were reported from the same village, 
time of symptom onset to death in the initial cluster was just one day with symptoms that included fevers, chills, headaches, muscle aches, abdominal pains, diarrhea, sweating, dizziness, shortness of breath, agitation, and others. It seems to be clustered in young adult males with rapid declining incidence, suggesting that it's not spreading in time or place. About 50% of these people are testing positive for malaria, but this is not that unusual because this area is highly endemic for malaria. So they don't know if this is a coincidence or if this is a new strain of malaria that is causing a lot of disease. It seems unlikely because malaria does not usually behave this way. The other thing that they're looking at is to see whether or not this is an organophosphate contamination or some sort of chemical. And this is another story that we're going to be keeping a close eye on as well. Since we had one of the worst flu seasons in the last 30 years, I would also take a look at this again, followed by the CDC, which you can follow, and we'll put a link in the description below. This is weekly U.S. influenza surveillance report, key updates for week seven, ending February 15, 2025. Scroll down here, we can see what's been going on in terms of the statistics. But the thing that I'm very interested in is to see whether or not we're going to get off this roller coaster ride. What we can definitely see is that influenza A is going down. What's not so apparent is what's going on to influenza B that seems to be still holding up, although it's a very small proportion of the totals here. And it's something that we should keep an eye on. But good news is that influenza is starting to abate. And that should not be too surprising because we are rapidly approaching the season of spring. And as we've shown many, many times, we know that not only influenza, but every single natural cause of death in the United States peaks around one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year. That's likely because of sunlight. Join us at medcram.com for medicine explained clearly. Subscribe, turn on notifications, and leave us a comment on topics that you want us to cover. Thanks for joining us.